Meeting in Washington for the 50th anniversary of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the member states on April 26 ratified the new strategic concept proposed by the United States. This permits NATO to go beyond its defensive role and intervene militarily, without a mandate from the United Nations, against a sovereign state. The token reference to the UN may satisfy France but does not seriously modify US power. The war in the Balkans, conducted without the authorization of the Security Council, in the name of humanitarian intervention, and the new strategic concept mark a turning point in the global order. For the first time since 1945 the victors of the Second World War, less Russia, have ignored the sole source of international legality, the UN, without replacing it. This allows China, India, or Russia, for example, to conduct similar interventions in their own spheres of influence, and increases the risks of injustice and conflict throughout the world. Welcome back to the Top Trendy Info channel, if it's your first time here please hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell for fast hand info as they happen. Here are many questions about the bombing of Yugoslavia by the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, meaning primarily the United States. They come down to two fundamental issues, what are the accepted and applicable rules of world order, and how do these or other considerations apply in the case of Kosovo? There is a regime of international law and international order, binding on all states, based on the United Nations Charter and subsequent resolutions and world court decisions. In brief, the threat or use of force is banned unless explicitly authorized by the Security Council after it has determined that peaceful means have failed, or else in self-defense against armed attack until the Security Council takes action. There is, of course, more to say. There is at least a tension, if not an outright contradiction, between the rules of world order laid down in the UN Charter and the rights articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a second pillar of the world order established under US initiative after the Second World War. The Charter bans force violating state sovereignty, the UD guarantees the rights of individuals against oppressive states. The issue of humanitarian intervention arises from this tension. It is this right that is claimed by the US-NATO in Kosovo, and is generally supported by editorial opinion and news reports. The question is addressed in a news report in the New York Times, headlined, Legal Scholar Support Case for Using Force, in Kosovo. One example is offered, Alan Gerson, former counsel to the US mission to the UN. Two other legal scholars are cited. One, Ted Galen Carpenter, scoffed at the administration argument and dismissed the alleged right of intervention. The third is Jack Goldsmith, a specialist on international law at Chicago Law School. He says that critics of the NATO bombing have a pretty good legal argument, but many people think, an exception for humanitarian intervention, does exist as a matter of custom and practice. That summarizes the evidence offered to justify the favored conclusion stated in the headline. Goldsmith's observation is reasonable, at least if we agree that facts are relevant to the determination of custom and practice. We may also bear in mind a truism, the right of humanitarian intervention, if it exists, is premised on the good faith of those intervening, and that assumption is based not on their rhetoric but on their record, in particular their record of adherence to the principles of international law, world court decisions, and so on. Consider, for example, Iranian offers to intervene in Bosnia to prevent massacres at a time when the West would not do so. These were dismissed with ridicule, in fact, ignored, if there was a reason beyond subordination to power, it was because Iranian good faith could not be assumed. A rational person then asks obvious questions, is the Iranian record of intervention and terror worse than that of the US? And how should we assess the good faith of the only country to have vetoed a Security Council resolution calling on all states to obey international law? What about its historical record? Unless such questions are prominent on the agenda of discourse, an honest person will dismiss it as mere allegiance to doctrine. A useful exercise is to determine how much of the literature, media or other, 
survive such elementary conditions as these. How do these or other considerations apply in the case of Kosovo? There has been a humanitarian catastrophe in Kosovo in the past year, overwhelmingly attributable to Yugoslav military forces. The main victims have been ethnic Albanian Kosovars, some 90% of the population of this Yugoslav territory. The standard estimate is 2,000 deaths and hundreds of thousands of refugees. In such cases, outsiders have three choices, solution 1, try to escalate the catastrophe, solution 2, do nothing, solution 3, try to mitigate the catastrophe. The choices can be illustrated by other contemporary cases. Let us keep to a few of approximately the same scale and ask where Kosovo fits into the pattern. To start with Colombia, according to State Department estimates the annual level of political killing by the government and its paramilitary associates is about at the level of Kosovo, and refugee flight is well over a million. Colombia has been the leading Western recipient of U.S. arms and training as violence has grown through the 1990s, and that assistance is now increasing under a drug war pretext dismissed by almost all serious observers. The Clinton administration was particularly enthusiastic in its praise for President Gaviria, whose tenure in office was responsible for appalling levels of violence, according to human rights organizations, even surpassing his predecessors. Details are readily available. In this case, the U.S. reaction was solution 1, escalate the atrocities. Then there is Turkey. By very conservative estimates, Turkish repression of Kurds in the 1990s falls into the category of Kosovo. It peaked in the early 1990s, one index is the flight of over a million Kurds from the countryside to the unofficial Kurdish capital Diyarbakir from 1990 to 94, as the Turkish army was devastating the countryside. The second year marked two records, it was the year of the worst repression in the Kurdish provinces of Turkey, as U.S. journalist Jonathan Randall reported from the scene, and also the year when Turkey became the biggest single importer of American military hardware and thus the world's largest arms purchaser. When human rights groups exposed Turkey's use of U.S. jets to bomb villages, the Clinton administration found ways to evade laws requiring suspension of arms deliveries, much as it was doing in Indonesia and elsewhere. Again Washington opted for solution one. Colombia and Turkey explain their atrocities on the grounds that they are defending their countries from the threat of terrorist guerrillas, as does the government of Slobodan Milosevic. The third example is Laos. Every year thousands of people, mostly children and poor farmers, are killed in the plain of jars in northern Laos, the scene of the heaviest bombing of civilian targets in history it appears, and arguably the most cruel. Washington's furious assault on a poor peasant society had little to do with its wars in the region. The worst period was from 1968, when Washington was compelled to undertake negotiations, under popular and business pressure, ending the regular bombardment of North Vietnam. Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon then decided to shift the planes to bombardment of Laos and Cambodia. The deaths are from bombies, tiny anti-personnel weapons, far worse than landmines. They are designed specifically to kill and maim, and have no effect on trucks, buildings, etc. The JARS plane was saturated with hundreds of millions of these criminal devices, which have a failure to explode rate of 20% to 30% according to the manufacturer, Honeywell. The numbers suggest either remarkably poor quality control or a rational policy of murdering civilians by delayed action. These were only a fraction of the technology deployed, including advanced missiles to penetrate caves where families sought shelter. Current annual casualties from bombies are estimated from hundreds to an annual nationwide casualty rate of 20,000, more than half of them deaths, according to the veteran Asia reporter Barry Wayne of the Asia edition of the Wall Street Journal. The crisis this year seems approximately comparable to Kosovo, though deaths are far more highly concentrated among children. There have been efforts to publicize and deal with the humanitarian catastrophe. A British-based mine advisory group, MAG, is trying to remove the lethal objects, 
but the U.S. is conspicuously missing from the handful of Western organizations that have followed MAG, the British press says, though it has finally agreed to train some Laotian civilians. The UK press also reports, with some anger, the allegation of MAG specialists that the U.S. refuses to provide them with render harmless procedures that would make their work a lot quicker and a lot safer. These remain a state secret, as does the whole affair in the U.S. The Bangkok Press reports a very similar situation in Cambodia, particularly the eastern region where U.S. bombardment from early 1969 was most intense. In this case, the U.S. opted for solution to do nothing. And the reaction of the media and commentators was to keep silent, following the norms under which the war against Laos was designated a secret war, meaning well-known but suppressed, as was also the case in Cambodia from March 1969. The level of self-censorship was extraordinary then, as is the current phase. The relevance of this shocking example needs no further comment. There are many other examples of solutions 1 and 2, and also much more serious contemporary atrocities, such as the huge slaughter of Iraqi civilians by means of a particularly vicious form of biological warfare. A very hard choice, said U.S. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright on national television in 1996 when asked for her reaction to the killing of half a million Iraqi children in five years, but, we think the price is worth it. Current estimates are about 5,000 children killed a month and the price is still worth it. These and other examples might also be kept in mind when we read odd rhetoric about how the moral compass of the Clinton administration is at last functioning properly, as the Kosovo example illustrates. Just what does the example illustrate? The threat of NATO bombing predictably led to a sharp escalation of atrocities by the Serbian army and paramilitaries, and to the departure of international observers, which of course had the same effect. NATO Commander General Wesley Clark declared that it was entirely predictable that Serb terror and violence would intensify after the NATO bombing, exactly as happened. Kosovo is therefore another illustration of Solution 1, try to escalate the violence, with exactly that expectation. Perhaps the most compelling example of Solution 3 is the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia in December 1978, terminating Pol Pot's atrocities which were then at their peak. Vietnam pleaded the right of self-defense against armed attack, one of the few post-UN charter examples when the plea is plausible. The Khmer Rouge regime, Democratic Kampuchea, DK, was carrying out murderous attacks against Vietnam in border areas. The U.S. reaction was instructive. The press condemned the Prussians of Asia for their outrageous violation of international law. They were harshly punished for the crime of having terminated Pol Pot slaughters, first by a U.S.-backed Chinese invasion, then by U.S. imposition of extremely harsh sanctions. The U.S. recognized the expelled DK as the official government of Cambodia because of its continuity with the Pol Pot regime, the State Department explained. Not too subtly, the U.S. supported the Khmer Rouge in its continuing attacks in Cambodia. The example tells us more about the custom and practice that underlies the emerging legal norms of humanitarian intervention. Despite the desperate efforts of ideologues to prove that circles are square, there is no serious doubt that the NATO bombings further undermine what remains of the fragile structure of international law. The U.S. made that entirely clear in the discussions leading to the NATO decision. Apart from the U.K., NATO countries were skeptical of U.S. policy and were particularly annoyed by Albright's saber-rattling. Today, the more closely one approaches the conflicted region, the greater the opposition to Washington's insistence on force, even within NATO. France had called for a U.N. Security Council resolution to authorize deployment of NATO peacekeepers. The U.S. flatly refused, insisting on its stand that NATO should be able to act independently of the United Nations, State Department officials explained. The U.S. refused to permit the word authorize to appear in the final NATO statement, unwilling to concede any authority to the U.N. Charter and international law. Only the word endorse was permitted. 
Similarly the bombing of Iraq was a brazen expression of contempt for the UN, even the specific timing, and was so understood. And of course the same is true of the destruction of half the pharmaceutical production of Sudan a few months earlier it could be argued, rather plausibly, that further demolition of the rules of world order is irrelevant, just as it had lost its meaning by the late 1930s. The contempt of the world's leading power for the framework of world order has become so extreme that there is nothing left to discuss. This stance is not new, it began to gain overt expression during the Kennedy years. The main innovation of the Reagan-Clinton years is that this defiance has become entirely open. The highest authorities explained with brutal clarity that the World Court, the UN and other agencies had become irrelevant because they no longer followed US orders, as they did in the early post-war years. Under Clinton the defiance of world order has become so extreme as to be of concern even to hawkish policy analysts. In the current issue of the leading establishment journal Foreign Affairs, Samuel Huntington warns that Washington is treading a dangerous course. In the eyes of much of the world, probably most of the world, he suggests, the US is becoming the rogue superpower, considered the single greatest external threat to their societies. A realistic international relations theory, he argues, predicts that coalitions may arise to counterbalance the rogue superpower. Where does that leave the question of what to do in Kosovo? It leaves it unanswered. The US has chosen a course of action which, as it explicitly recognizes, escalates atrocities and violence, a course of action that also strikes yet another blow against the regime of international order, which does offer the weak at least some limited protection from predatory states. A standard argument is that we had to do something, we could not simply stand by as atrocities continued. That is never true. One choice, always, is to follow the Hippocratic principle, first, do no harm. If you can think of no way to adhere to that elementary principle, then do nothing. There are always ways that can be considered. Diplomacy and negotiations are never at an end. Recognized principles of international law and world order, solemn treaty obligations, decisions by the world court, considered pronouncements by the most respected commentators, these do not automatically solve particular problems. Each issue has to be considered on its merits. For those who do not adopt the standards of Saddam Hussein, there is a heavy burden of proof to meet in undertaking the threat or use of force in violation of the principles of international order. Perhaps the burden can be met, but that has to be shown, not merely proclaimed with passionate rhetoric. The consequences of such violations have to be assessed carefully. And for those who are minimally serious, the reasons for the actions also have to be assessed, and not simply by adulation of our leaders and their moral compass. Kindly keep following for more updates. Tell us what you think about this on the comments section and don't forget to subscribe to this channel.